WBNE. Hello and welcome to episode 80, all about Return of the King, theatrical edition, part two, being the 80th part of That's What I'm Talking About. My name is Mary Clay. If that's too complicated for you, just call me MC. And today I'm joined by graphic novelist Molly Knox Ostertag. Thank you, Molly, for coming on. Hello. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm always down to talk about Lord of the Rings. So I was trying to think, I was like, how did I, how did I find Molly? I think at some point or another, someone must have tagged me in one of your Lord of the Rings related tweets. And then when I was starting to cover the movies... Uh, I asked people to recommend me who who should I have on and your name popped up. And so I emailed you immediately. This was back in October. <laughs> and then here we are mid-December. I, this Oh, also, this episode won't come out until after the new year, too. Oh, my gosh. Because I've gotten, I've gotten ahead and I've also ended up covering two towers for longer than I planned. So <laughs> they're, they're very long movies. It's you need a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it takes a long time to get through them. Yeah, exactly. So I'm so glad we're finally able to sit down. And yeah, talk. yeah, yeah. I requested just that we get to talk about some of the like angsty Sam Frodo scenes. because oh. That's my 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 specialty, I would say. <laughs> Punch in the gut. Yes. Yeah. So um, <laughs> tell me a bit about your like history with Lord of the Rings. How did you first get into it? Do you have any specific memories associated with watching the movies? Yeah, I um, so my dad read me the books and the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings when I was really little. And so I kind of like learn to read like looking over his shoulder and so I have this like very very deep connection um to the books and then when the movies came out I was like probably like 10 or 11 I think when they started coming out and it was just like everything I had ever wanted from a movie and it was I got so obsessed I went so deep in it I like learned Elvish I had no friends because I was like too too much into this stuff um and so it was very much like a middle school fixation for me um, and then I kind of left it behind a little bit. So I was like, I have to be a normal person. This is embarrassing. <laughs> um, and then I think in the last couple of years as a as an adult, um, I'm just I'm, I've just like realized how much I love them and how much uh, there's like these themes and messages in them that like I really relate to as an adult um, that I didn't quite pick up on as a kid. And so there, mm-hmm. it's sort of like been really fun to go back and do this deep dive this year, specifically like 2020 in quarantine. I watched them I, they hit me really hard it's like this oh. story to me it's this like romance at the end of the world and I was like I feel this very very deeply in my bones like being trapped in my house with my wife all the time like it feels I don't know it has this like there's something resonant about it um so I got super obsessed and I have been spending like all year drawing fan art and writing fan fiction and just like kind of like letting myself really have fun with it so so yeah this year has been the year that it's escalated to like a true obsession um yeah. that's awesome <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I like I don't know if it's just because like I was really getting into podcasting on this, you know, subject material this year or if it actually was this way. But it seems to me that there was this like resurgence in the Lord of the Rings fandom this year because of quarantine and everyone um, and like social isolation and everything. And people were turning the movies on because like when else when else you are never going to have the free time in your normal normal life to sit down and watch 12 hours of this yeah. movie more than that if you're doing extended edition probably <laughs> so yeah. now that people are you know things have been canceled and you should be staying home as much as you possibly can and people are turning the movies on or finally picking up the books after saying like mm-hmm. one day I'm gonna read the books but they're very daunting books to read as someone who read them <laughs> yeah I hadn't read them since I was like an early teen like probably 13 or 14 and so it was really cool to like go back and do a reread and even like I, I always would skip over the landscape descriptions because they were so boring oh my and gosh. Then this time I was like oh like describe this mountains to me describe the hillside and the trees like that sounds nice I would love to be seeing something that's not my bedroom right now that is true yeah that's a good point that's a good point um it was really funny because during my uh read through chapter by chapter I think it was like right towards the start of quarantine was when I I was getting to the end of two towers and I was beginning return of the king and it was like right when Frodo and Sam were getting into Mordor and they're going into um 
It's called as I learned from the movie, which we'll we'll talk about in a second. Kirith Ungol. I pronounced it Sirith Ungol the entire time, and no one oh, corrected yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the description of that is like it was dark and never ending. They forgot what sunlight felt like, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> beautiful scenery yeah I'll take that yeah no it's very relatable and I think it 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 just has these like themes to me of like hope and despair and endurance that when times are hard and when you feel like you're like I can't save the world I can't even affect the world I'm just a very small person but like I still can do my best yeah um so yeah that's like definitely what I've always taken from Mm -hmm. from the story this week we are uh back obviously talking about Return of the King theatrical edition reminder that I will be doing extended edition so everyone put your phone down stop tweeting at me I will be covering (laughs) extended edition and we are picking up where we left off last week where we had we had uh what are their names Pippin and Gandalf were talking about the Witch King and Gandalf's narration goes over as we see Frodo Sam and Gollum sneaking up on Minas Morgul Gollum brings Frodo and Sam to the stairs of Sirith, I mean Kirith, on Gull, which are more like a really steep ladder than actual stairs and not exactly the secret tunnel that I was picturing when I was reading the book. The Witch King reveals his presence in a very dramatic fashion to let everyone in the land know that he's the real deal. Realizing that they're totally forked because there's no way Denethor is going to do anything, Gandalf sends Pippin on a very important mission quest thing to light the beacons, and it's real dope. Aragorn runs through Edoras to deliver the message to Theoden that Gondor calls for aid, and to the shock of everyone, Rohan will answer. Osgiliath falls to Sauron's forces and my boy Faramir barely makes it out alive. He's surprised to see another hobbit in Minas Tirith and gives Pippin and Gandalf a bit of hope that Frodo and Sam are still alive. But not too much hope because it is Mordor after all. The stairs of Kirith Angul are proving themselves difficult. Gollum keeps driving the wedge between Frodo and Sam but it'll be okay because Frodo and Sam are besties and they always listen to each other and trust each other, right? Right? Gandalf provides the absolute minimum comfort to the soldiers of Minas Tirith as they prepare for imminent doom. Pippin swears his allegiance to Gondor and Denethor is way too excited about it. Then he sees Faramir with those sad blue eyes and his good mood is ruined. None too pleased that Osgiliath has fallen, Denethor admits that he wishes Faramir were dead instead of Boromir. Excuse me for a second. Oh my god! Ahem. <clears throat> Faramir continues to show us that he is a man of quality and agrees to go take back Osgiliath even though it's a lost cause. Gollum sneaks around while Frodo and Sam sleep. Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. He steals the lame bus bread, throws it over a cliff, and sprinkles some crumbs on Sam's cloak. When the hobbits discover that the lame bus is missing, Sam sees right through Gollum's plans and throws hands. Frodo sides with Gollum again, weakened by the power of the ring. Seeing its effects on him, Sam offers to carry it for him. Big mistake. Frodo turns on Sam in such an unfair fight that even I felt bad for Sam. And I don't even like Sam that much. Frodo tells him to go home and he continues on with Gollum, leaving Sam behind. Gandalf tries to stop Faramir from going on the suicide mission to Osgiliath by telling him the flat out lie that Denethor loves him. Denethor requests some ambiance from Pippin while he aggressively eats cherry tomatoes. Pippin sings for him as Faramir and the soldiers begin their attack on Osgiliath. It's fine. This is fine. To me, this had a lot of um, vibes from The Wizard of Oz. First, there was like, it gave me, it reminded me when the uh, lion and Scarecrow and Tin Man are like sneaking up after Dorothy's been captured. <laughs> and then when we when we pan out, the like Minas Morgul like city has this green Ozian glow to it almost. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I think they talked about that on Newcomers too. They were like, they're ripping off Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I forgot to like mention that you were, I saw, yeah, I saw recently that you were a guest on newcomers and that's just like oh my gosh I'm so I want to like live vicariously through you because they're such funny comedians (laughs) and the fact that they're doing Lord of the Rings is so funny (laughs) I know I they're they're so funny and I'm such fans of both of both Nicole Byer and Lauren Lapkus but yeah I felt bad because I think they were like a little tired of Lord of the Rings at this point (laughs) and I was just trying to like really defend defend my thing while not being too obnoxious (laughs) but I think we had fun I hope we had fun. <laughs> yeah, it's very Ozian, yeah. it seemed to me. So I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Gollum points out that that he's like, oh, they're the stairs of Kirith Ungol, which, yes, like I said, mm-hmm. the entire time I was reading the book, I said Sirith Ungol. And this was even knowing someone had told me that basically all of the C's in Tolkien are pronounced like a hard K. So I knew this in advance 
Like, I, I, I already knew this, and I kept yeah. calling it Sirathon Goal. So to everyone who was a guest for a chapter where I said Sirathon Goal and didn't tell me, to everyone who didn't correct me on social media or in Discord, like, come on, guys. Like, <laughs> uh. do, you ha- do you have a large contingent of, like, very intense Tolkien fans who are getting on you about this stuff? No, um, because a lot of... <laughs> I have, uh, I have deterred a lot of the intense Tolkien fans. Okay, yeah, because I feel like... I- I, yeah, I, I have like a real love hate relationship with that side of the yeah. fandom where I'm like, listen, I will go fully, fully to the end. Like, I will go so deep into all the nerd stuff, all the lore, but like, it has to be gay, <laughs> which is what they always get. Mad I'm about. like very fortunate that the audience of people that I found have been like the very fun part of the Lord of the Rings fandom. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I'm fine to go into the like more nitty gritty and talk about like the details and like the scholarly aspect of it. But um, I kind of started this podcast from like a whole point of view of like, I'm not going to take this too seriously because like if you want to listen to a serious podcast about Lord of the Rings, or or watch you know people dissect it you can watch tons of other youtube videos and podcasts and stuff that are nine times out of ten hosted by men and Mm -hmm. so i was like i'm gonna just come in loud and proud and be an obnoxious uh woman in the lord of the rings (laughs) fandom yeah well and i think it's fun because like it should be accessible and i think it is this really lovely story that sometimes people get very intimidated by because yeah. of all the names and all of the like like ephemera and all the lore and it's just like you don't ultimately it like is a pretty simple like compelling story mm-hmm. um, yeah. 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 So Gollum points out, he's like, oh, those are the stairs. And I'm like, those aren't stairs. That's a ladder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a poorly constructed ladder. And um, I don't know when I was reading the book if I just like misread the way he was describing it or if they just made this change for the movie to like add more dramatic effect that like, oh, they could fall off and fall down this mountain. But I thought it was more like in a cave or like a tunnel. Yeah, I think in the book, it's more like a tunnel because they can't they're like in the complete darkness for most of it yeah okay cool glad I like didn't totally misinterpret that yeah this whole like like part since so I'm glad that you've read the book because you sort of like know the way that the movie deviates from the book too I feel like this is all very added and it's all very Peter Jackson which I like it I like the angst and the drama of it um but yeah it's so different in the book because in the book it's just like they're just walking through the darkness holding hands and like <laughs> sleeping and being sad and then Peter yeah. Jackson is like here's all this angst <laughs> yeah they needed to like add a little bit more drama I was talking about mm-hmm. um on the previous episode that this whole like rift that they added in for the movie between Frodo and Sam, which doesn't happen in the book, is more to show the intensity and to show the weight that the ring is having on Frodo and to be able to like visually and physically see the effect that it's taking on him because Mm -hmm. you can read, like you know his thoughts in the book because you have his narration and you can read that but you have to you have to find a way to externalize that and so yeah. they did that by showing this rift and this strain on their friendship absolutely and i think that i think that movies often thrive on more like visual conflict and more like i think that a book it is more interesting to read about like like they they are so steady like sam and frodo are such like so supportive of each other throughout the whole book and it never really changes and i can see why I think that like the movie it like makes it more visually interesting to have yeah. have this like rift in their relationship, but it is so heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh. Um. So about this, the the set of the stairs of Kirith on Goal. So they were crafted out of I did never know how to say this word polystyrene. Sure. Oh. Um. And they actually were really difficult to film on. The steps were so steep and fragile that they sometimes broke, and oh. because they were sprayed down with water which I don't understand why they sprayed them down with water. I don't get that. Um, Sean Aston and Elijah Wood would sometimes get their hobbit feet stuck in the steps and then they would have to be pulled off. Oh my God. Yeah. It's so sad. Wait, like they're like the like adhesive on their feet would stick to the steps. Yeah, so they're I don't know if I've talked oh, to I don't no. know if I've um talked about the the Hobbit feet 
before um on the on the podcast but they were like rubber feet that they had to be like prosthetics that they had to be fitted for like every single and it time took, like an hour to get them yeah into them. and they yeah. um there was no way to save them when they were done filming at the end of the day so they just had to keep making hobbit feet and there's a couple scenes when they're when it's like a wide shot and they're walking around where you can like just see the foot flopping because it's rubber you know so <laughs> I didn't know that they had to throw them out at the end of every day that's yeah. so funny oh my god just like dumpsters full of hairy feet <laughs> and if I'm not I might be misremembering this or like remembering a different trivia fact or something but I think I read somewhere that they had to destroy them because they were afraid that someone would like take them and try to sell them on like black market for like Lord of the Rings ultra fans <laughs> and sell them for like an absurd amount of money so they would destroy them that's so they so couldn't funny. do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, I love that. Have you seen the behind the scenes photos of the prosthetic faces that their size doubles would have? Like it was I don't like, think so. No. Okay. There's a really funny because like they would have like a group of like, I think they had children and also little people who were playing the hobbits from a distance and they would have full prosthetic faces that looked like Elijah Wood or Sean Astin. And there's just like some very funny photos of like just boxes of just oh, like their disembodied faces. faces. Oh, that's so creepy. And I, I always, I'm so curious, like what did they do with those faces? Oh, I what happened know. to them after the end of the movie? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I knew they had, I knew they had body doubles. I did not know they made them prosthetic faces faces yeah oh that's so creepy I know oh that's they so look creepy. wild I'll try to find that it's it's somewhere in the appendices I'll try to send you um the the photo of just all the faces in the box because it's so funny oh my gosh yeah I haven't even like begun to delve in because I have a the blu-ray like golden extended edition box mm-hmm. set that has the like 20 plus hours of oh my god behind yes. the scenes features i haven't even begun to dive into that stuff yet so oh that's crazy um <laughs> anyway yeah so they're so they're they're climbing the stairs oh wait no actually so what happens first is frodo is like being drawn over to minas morgul because mm-hmm. the witch king is is suiting up for battle and mm-hmm. the uh, Frodo no god what are their names Sam and Gollum <laughs> I'm doing this a lot more lately because in the in the movies all of the characters are together whereas chapter by chapter it was just like two or three people at a time oh sure yeah <laughs> um Sam and and Gollum run over and grab Frodo and pull mm-hmm. him away right as this beam of light dramatically bursts up in the air. It's very cool. And there's like a shot showing uh, Gandalf and Pippin reacting to it. And it's a really sweet moment where like Gandalf sees Pippin is frightened and he like puts his arm around him and like comforts him. They are everything to me. Like just that like like vibe of Gandalf being like Pippin is so annoying and then being like, I already have a little bit of respect for Pippin and I'm going to be a little bit comforting is, Mm. is, that means everything to me. Yeah. We see it, we see everyone in the land basically seeing this and Mm -hmm. it's just kind of like a whoops moment because now we have this, you know, evil that is about to be unleashed and we see them marching out. I think it was in this shot where I was reminded of like, oh, that looks like the the city of Oz um, when they're all marching out. They hear the screech of of the Witch King and Frodo says, I can feel his blade because it's the same Nazgul who had stabbed him on Weathertop. And it's such a good, like, it's moments like this where you really remember that Peter Jackson was like a horror director before he did Lord of the Rings and he just captures these like really intense tension moments of, of like you like get this sense of impending dread, but you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And mm-hmm. it's I, I I I'm like so in awe of, of scenes like that when it's like all the sound will cut out and then like yes. the screen will rattle and then then the beam of light shoots up and it's like the like orchestra comes in and it's just so well done. Yeah, he's really good at um at building tension at the right moments before mm-hmm. before a really big moment. Yeah. So so Frodo, Sam, and Gollum begin climbing the stairs as I they were as hard to climb filming as they were in the actual movie. They're having a they're having a rough go of it and we'll check in with them later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um and then we see Gandalf grabbing for uh pippin <laughs> we see gandalf grabbing pippin mm-hmm. and pulling him in venus tirith and it's like now is like another opportunity for the shire folk to to <laughs> throw their hat into the ring whatever 
Gandalf is just, he's like the agent for all the hobbits. He's like, I've got a great opportunity for you. (laughs) (laughs) We need people to know that hobbits can also be great. Mm -hmm. And he plans to use Pippin to light the beacons because they're seeing now, it's like become a, it's become apparent that they can't wait for Denethor to do something. They have to do something Mm -hmm. themselves. He tells Pippin, this is very important that Pippin is going to go light the beacon. We have a scene at Osgiliath showing the orcs and forces of Sauron coming up on Osgiliath. I don't understand why they're tra- they're like trying to they're one of them is like dipping a paddle into the water and it goes too loud and one of them goes shh and I'm like I literally never understood this. I'm like scene why are you trying they, to be quiet? They can see you probably. They just did a, a beacon so I don't know why like I don't this like the whole like landscape of like Minas Tirith as Gilead Minas Morgul is so confusing to me and I've never been able to understand it no matter how many times I've like gone over the map but yeah I don't know what's going on with that scene yeah and so they're trying to like sneak in and I'm like but they they already know you're coming so you don't need to be stealthy (laughs) I guess they thought they were coming from a different direction different angle yeah yeah, and instead they're coming from the river. Like, they didn't expect them to have boats or something. Yeah, I was going to say, because they're coming, yeah, if they're coming from the river, <laughs> then that would be, because when they come back to try and take us, Gilly, if they're on land. So, yeah, so right now, Sauron and his people, or not Sauron, but his forces are, yeah, coming from the opposite direction. You know, yeah. I'm not, I need to, like, go back to what I was doing when I was reading, which is, like, I just, I would go into, like, spirals trying to figure out, like, the landscape and the geography of everything and be like, so where are they in relationship to, you know, Minas Tirith or Mordor? And I would just like get totally lost. So I just need to like go back to that. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I think at a certain, like it's very, it's confusing and complicated and definitely is all thought out, but I don't know if it all, the book stuff always corresponds to the movie yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. I wrote this like very intense, like very, very long fan fiction um, that was just like all about Frodo and Sam and it, I feel like I understood the movements of the characters so much better because I had to like dig into every scene and be like, so why are they going on the river right now? Like, where are they going? <laughs> What's the point? And it was like, I was like going through all the maps and really figuring it out. So, so yeah, the battle on Osgiliath begins. We see Faramir, my boy, my boy, um, is, a good one. is fighting yeah. uh, and it's an intense battle to say the mm-hmm. least. Then we have Pippin lighting the beacon and he sneaks up and climbs up and cuts the, he like pours the oil and cuts the the flame and it lights on fire. He has a moment where he's like, oh, this is on fire. I need to, I need to leave. <laughs> it's so cute. I love, when I was like 12 and I was watching these movies, I had such a crush on Pippin. And so I'm like, this is like the big Pippin movie. And I feel like every scene that he's in, I just have like a little like, t- like baby feeling about it. I'm Aww. just like, oh, I love this boy. <laughs> He's so stupid. (laughs) It's also like, it's just hard not to like him in this moment because this is really, um, and this is where in the book too, in these chapters, this is where Pippin is like really stepping up and he's not, he's not just a fool of a took anymore. Well, he still still is a little bit. He'll always be a fool of a took, but he's stepping (laughs) up and is like, you see him like really growing and starting to grasp the severity of the war. Whereas before he was a lot more, you know, it was just like Mary and Pippin bopping around, following the fellowship wherever they go and then slowly yeah. realizing that they can't just be silly little hobbits anymore they have to like yeah. be more active in this yeah and him being like separated from mary who's always looked oh. out for him and just suddenly being like it's he's on his own he's like it's the consequences of his actions and he has to he has to step up and also gandalf is like i, I don't know gandalf like doesn't have any expectations of him but then gandalf is like kind of surprised when he does step up and is like all right i'll swear my allegiance to denethor and i feel like i feel like pippin is just like i have to impress gandalf like yeah. <laughs> he can't keep thinking that i'm the stupidest person in middle earth like i can't live with this he's like i totally blew it for everyone by looking at the palantir i need to make this up somehow mm-hmm. yeah i also there's a quick shot back to gandalf like waiting in some courtyard or whatever where pippin had like been climbing up to the beacon and it's mm-hmm. him being like oh act casual <laughs> <laughs> nothing i love it so much. nothing going on here <laughs> we see we see the guard up there be like oh crap it's on fire oh no the beacon <laughs> is lit that guard yeah. is being fired <laughs> 
If they I know. Survive. I feel like I. I feel like everyone kind of wanted the beacons to be lit, but nobody, nobody like nobody was going to step up Jennifer. to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they're like, "Oh no, what a shame!" <laughs> it's we all just stand here and watch. I do question the. I, I like question the beacon system because, like, if it can be so. Like, you see the domino effect that it has, where this beacon is lit, and then the next one goes, next one goes, and then Gondor, you know, calls for aid, Rohan will answer. That, like, what happens if just, like, a gust of wind comes and knocks the flame over (laughs) accidentally? Does everyone just, like, go into battle all of a sudden? And be like, oh, "Oh, that's a good question. False alarm. It was just an accident. It was an accident. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, the fact that they literally have like a flame ready at all times like you don't even bring up your own little candle to light the beacon it's like it could happen at any moment yeah so (laughs) but isn't that such i love that scene like the swooping over the mountains and the music we (sighs) see yeah we see gandalf reacting and he's like excited you see denethor skulking in the shadows and he's real pissed about it (laughs) um and yeah we see all of the beacons being lit for the lighting of the beacon sequence one beacon was helicoptered up to the top of the mountain and then lit and the rest were all computer generated wow i didn't know that they made one that was really i did wonder though like how that i was like so because my dumb brain was just like obviously they had to like lug this giant pyre up to a mountaintop across the landscape of new zealand and light it on fire (laughs) it didn't like occur to me they could do it digitally i love the implication that like like the in-world implication of these people who just live on the mountain, like waiting and waiting and waiting and just like they their whole job is just to look in one direction and be like, maybe the beacon will be lit today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, yeah, the sweet, like we get another shot of the beautiful sweeping landscape of New Zealand. Got to show that off at least once a movie. The music is so the good. Is so good. It's so, it's, it's so very thrilling. good. Yeah. I remember seeing the scene in theaters for the first time and just like being so blown away. It's really interesting you say that, though, because the first time when I was first watching this, so this whole sequence of Pippin sneaking up and lighting the beacons and the beacons, you know, being lit and Aragorn seeing it and Rohan going to help, none of that happens in the book. So when this was happening in the Mm. movie, the first time I watched it, I was more just kind of like, what's what's going on? So and I was watching with one of my friends and she was like staring at me the whole time to to be like isn't that the most amazing thing you saw and I was like just kind of you know processing like oh this is something new that I wasn't imagining from the book what's going on here so it didn't really the first time I watched it I was just like I don't I don't get it what's happening but like I think it was the second time I watched it I was like oh yeah yeah Yeah. that was cool that was good that was good yeah I feel like Return of the King deviates the most from the book Mm-hmm. Um, it does. probably in terms of like like adding new plot and like like really like changing where people are and what they're doing um which just makes sense because it's like movies are different than books but yeah yeah this scene is so it's just so incredibly cool and there's something about the themes of like like Denethor being prideful and not being able to ask for help because he's already kind of like given into despair and um being like no you have to ask for help you have to like just reach out and ask is like a really sweet theme to me. And it's also that really parallels because so we have, so we, we go back to Edoras where kind of the rest of the gang are and Aragorn sees the beacon and he goes running up and like bursts through the door. He's so gangly. (laughs) He's like flopping all over the place. I was watching that and I was like, is that actually Viggo? Like, I'm sure that was actually Viggo Mortensen running. I'm sure they didn't like get a, a, you know, body double or whatever to do that because Viggo Mortensen would have been like no I can do that but like he 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 runs weird (laughs) he does and I love it because he's so he's so badass and put together usually and then it's just like he's sort of gawky yeah and gangly and is like flinging himself up the steps and it's it's it makes me like him yeah and he bursts in and says the beacons are lit Gondor calls for aid and he's like out of breath and there's this long pause. <laughs> Legolas gives him this look that's just like, oh, cringe. Like, so that like, is what I call, <laughs> um, what I have dubbed uh, Orlando Bloom eyebrow acting, which oh is what he does for all of Legolas. 
It's just his eyebrows. Yeah, because he's cut all of his lines because he's not very good <laughs> at delivering lines. <laughs> so there's just a lot of mysterious scenes where you're like, I feel like there probably was a line and Orlando Bloom probably beefed it. And <laughs> oh, no. It's just um, his eyebrows. <laughs> just his eye. He, he's just so intense, those elves, mm-hmm, their mm-hmm. eyes. Yes. Um, and you have a moment in this pause of like, okay, so we just, we had a scene earlier where Aragorn said, let's go help Gondor. Let's go help them. And Theoden says, no, we're not going to do that. Um, mm-hmm. Did they help us? And it's like, well, yeah. no. Where was you... Gondor when the Westfold fell? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's like still being very petty, which we saw this happening in Helm's Deep or before, yeah. the, before the battle where he is, he's like, Gondor would never help us. They haven't helped us before, blah, blah, blah. And we see him being petty now or being petty in Return of the King in an earlier scene. And then like you were saying earlier about how Denethor is refusing to call for help and and being very prideful. And so now we have this moment where Theoden is processing and is like, okay, they're calling for aid. And we're like, all right, this is your chance, dude. Mm -hmm. Are you going to step up and and answer the call for help or are you going to be petty again? And he finally steps up and says, and Rohan will answer. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. I definitely, in my head, I'm like, Theoden and Denethor are like like angsty exes like they're (laughs) mad at each other they had a bad breakup and it's like well I'm not gonna call him for help (laughs) and it's like all right well he's calling me for help (laughs) like it's it's I feel like it just makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) um so Rohan gets ready to go off to battle Aomer is sent off to gather up everyone he can and in three days Mm -hmm. they will meet up and leave we see Eowyn says that she will ride with the men to the encampment and Aragorn's like "Uh uh-huh lifts up a blanket on her horse and sees a, a sword. He doesn't say anything, but he, he gives her a look, a judgment. I like it. It's very cool of Aragorn to not not like mention. <laughs> he's, he's like, are you going to do something? I'm not going to I'm not going to interfere. It's it's it was very much like Aragorn, just mind your business. Just mind mind yourself when he yeah. she's like, I, oh, I'm just going to ride with the men. And then she like flips up the bl- or he flips up the blanket and there's a sword and he's like, uh huh. Yeah, you're just gonna ride with us to the to the camp. Yeah, I'm sure that's yeah, all you're doing. That's what you need this sword for. And she gives him a look like, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is prepared to ride with you and with Theoden to death. And this is consistent with her character in the book where she's very she's depressed and she's like, uh, the oh, only she's... way I can have any kind of honor as a woman is to die in battle. And I can't she's even so do that. She's so sad in the book. She's so depressed. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. Well, and I love there is this there's just this tragedy to the Rohirrim where it's sort of implied in the book, I think a little bit more than the movie, but just like this culture is dying a little bit. Like mm-hmm. they are at the end of like, they're not, I think in the book, there's all this stuff about like, they used to have really great horses. Like all their horses were like shadow facts and now they're not as good. And then and it's, Gandalf like, everything's... took shadow facts. I know. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Gandalf. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it's this feeling and you can see it in Theoden's eyes when he's looking at the assembled group of writers where he's like, probably we're not going to come back. This probably is the end of Rohan as I know it, but it's worth it to like like yeah. go out defending defending something that matters. Yeah, that happens um several times in the book too in this section where there's like there's a lot of foreshadowing and like setting up by Theoden himself that like I'm going to die and this is going to be like my last hoorah with yeah. Rohan and as the king. And we we see that cuz there's this shot where he is it's like random voiceover in the theatrical edition I think it's kind of strange the way that um I've seen what they do were how they edit extended down to theatrical edition with the other two I have a feeling there was like a scene where he actually said says those lines and then they just took it and used it for voiceover here no it actually is voiceover because I was watching I don't have the theatrical edition so I just watched this morning the extended edition and so that's how it is Oh, I don't know why. It's just like a little, little bit of Theoden, like in- internal thoughts. 
okay, then that's weird. I was trying Which to like. Which is very strange because you're like, no other character yeah, I was has trying this. to like <laughs> give them a little bit like a benefit of the doubt of like, oh, maybe he says this in extended edition, but no? Okay. All right. No, well, anyway, strange. yeah. Yeah. He has a voiceover yeah. talking, thinking about like kind of the legacy and everything yeah. and the battle. And we. Yeah. All, all the Rohirrim are just about like going out in a blaze of glory. It's, it's really interesting. And that like Eowyn is kind of like, she wants that so badly. And then like, I know, as you know can't. in the book, it's kind of like, you can't, you can't all die in a blaze of glory. Some of you have to stay and carry on your That culture. is true. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's really tender. We have um uh, a shot of the, the flag and like the, the crest of Rohan mm-hmm. to it's, it's like a very pivotal moment to, to set up that this is, this is it. You know, yeah. the calm before the storm, the deep breath before the plunge, as yeah, Gandalf says. Yeah. And everyone rides off. We have a shot of Mary is on. Mm. He's not. On, I don't think he, it might just be a pony or just a small horse. I don't know. But like his horse is a little bit smaller than everyone else's. And he's so happy. I know, but he <laughs> cannot get it to go. <laughs> oh. He's like, I don't know what to do with this pony. Yeah. So they all ride off. We show again the battle that's happening at Asgiliath and things are not going well. Mm-hmm. And there's this one part where Faramir like runs over and is like running away. And someone says like, Faramir, look out. And he like moves. And then like half a second later, a whole like group of people fire off arrows. And I'm like, so would y'all <laughs> have done that if he like hadn't moved? Like he was like just in the nick of time to like be able to hide. <laughs> it was a close one, but uh <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he almost almost became a pincushion. Yeah. Is this when the Nazgul come in on their their beasts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Nazgul come so in on cool. their beasts. Um and their or Faramir orders everyone to fall back to Minas Tirith. They retreat, they leave Osgiliath, abandon it, and yeah. the Nazgul are flying over on their beasts. We get our first Wilhelm scream of Return of the King. Oh my god, I wish I could have a version of these movies that just didn't have the Wilhelm screams. <laughs> it's so annoying. <laughs> well, and it's so, um, we were talking about this in the Two Towers episode where the Wilhelm scream showed up there, that yeah. like... Back in the early 2000s, this idea of the Wilhelm scream wasn't really a thing because it was just something that editors did as a fun like joke between sound editors. Yeah. And it wasn't yeah. until people started putting like compilation videos on YouTube that everyone started being able to go, oh, that was the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. So they're not doing it like exactly on purpose in this movie. They're just, or they're not expecting to, it to be noticed. Exactly. <laughs> um, however, that being said, they put about, I don't know how many of them are in Return of There's the King. A lot but it's a in lot. Return of the King. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just love, so like to go from something I hate, which is the Wilhelm scream, to something that I love. Um, thinking about like the way that movies now shoot really big CGI, the way that a movie now would shoot the fell beasts is so different than the way they're shot in Return of the King because I feel like they're never quite focused on. Like you always see them from the perspective of the people that they're attacking. Mm-hmm. They're always just like these big, like fast moving things that like swoop in and grab some horses and swoop out. And it, you don't like, I, I feel like a movie now would do more of like, we're going to show you every single detail of our like CGI model. And I love how this is like, it's not shot that way. And so it feels so much like that's the reason why the CGI in this movie holds up so well is that it's shot like with an appropriate sense of scale. Yeah. And it's also, yeah, it's in, I will say it is, it is the moments where you do stop and focus on the CGI things that you notice when like, oh, that's what, cause there was, there was a moment earlier where the witch King is on his beast and it like, mm-hmm. it very much looks like this was an actor on a green screen lot. Mm-hmm. And you know, he was writing like a green screen dummy thing that yeah, was CGI yeah. in later. So, so when the, yeah, when they're moving in the action sequences is when it holds up uh fairly well yeah yeah and when they they really like focus on the impact that these like like cgi because i feel like Gollum is the same way they just focus on the impact that it has in the world of like making sure everything sounds right making sure it feels like heavy and feels like like really tangible in this way that i just like it's just like weird that movies don't do that more like it's weird how much better they look than so many monster movies coming out right now yeah 
we get a great shot of a horse just being annihilated by one of the mm-hmm. it's like picked up by its claws and 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 is like th- tossed around and it was like yes. very jarring a lot, of, a lot of horse death yeah a lot of yeah. horse death the Ro- yeah. rohan is not happy in this movie Mm-mm. gandalf comes riding in yeah the white rider and also that pippin so good so good <laughs> pippin's there too why is pippin there like, I don't, it does not okay matter. i'm so glad you also i was like why did you take pippin with you gandalf like earlier like later <laughs> or later when the battle starts happening you tell pippin to like go away so why did you take him with you into battle i don't get it maybe they were like going to get something else and he just didn't have time to, to get drop him off, off or whatever, the horse. he was like we were going to the drive through to get like del taco yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we i was like Detour. okay i guess i have to go out Detour, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i love i love the music in this scene though and again the sound and the way like the sound just cuts out and you just like hear the horse hooves. It's so good. Yeah. And Gandalf uses some of that classic Gandalf the White mm-hmm. wizard magic that we don't really quite get <laughs> how it works, but it works He really works doesn't enough. do it very often, but in this one case, it yeah. works very well. Yeah. It wards the Nazgul off and they're able to make it safely back into Minas Tirith. Faramir calls... Calls him Mithrandir, which is important, mm-hmm. like an important detail from the book, because that's a very scholarly name for Gandalf. Mm-hmm. And um, Faramir is a scholar first and like warrior second. And that yeah. has a lot to do with his character. I think that Gandalf even taught Faramir a little bit. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like when he was a kid, which is very cute. Denethor calls him a wizard's pupil at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of like feeds into why Denethor hates Faramir. Um, yeah, <sighs> Denethor is truly the worst. <laughs> uh, ch- speaking of which, yeah, so Faramir is saying like, mm-hmm. oh, Asgiliath has fallen, blah, 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 And someone says like, oh, Denethor saw this coming. And Gandalf says, foreseen and done nothing. Damn. <laughs> Brutal. Yes, I love Gandalf, like, destroying Denethor at every oh, chance. It makes me great. so happy. Love There's, it. like, a part when he hits him in the face with the staff. It's so good. Love it. <laughs> um, and he, like, turns around on his horse and reveals Pippin, and Faramir has a reaction that makes Gandalf go, this is not the first halfling you've seen. And the hope that goes across <sighs> Pippin and Gandalf's face when Faramir says, yes, I saw... I met Frodo not two days ago. And just the hope you see in their faces of like, he's still alive. This actually yeah. might, this could work. This might actually work. Which is, yeah, like they have not heard from them for, for so, so long. Gandalf especially has not seen them since Moria. Like mm-hmm. it's, they and they really have no way of knowing what's happening with them. And just, just to be like, oh no, they were here two days ago. And like they're they're still on their quest is, is it's so lovely. Pippin's like the yeah the look on Pippin's face is so wonderful when he realizes. And then yeah, Faramir kind of like hits him with the the not the hard truth, but like hits him with a one two punch. Like first it's mm-hmm. like oh they're alive yay, and then he says like they're on their way to Kirith on goal. Ah. Which like I just like need to know what Faramir knows. That's what Does he I... know about the spider? <laughs> so that's also kind of like alluded to in the book a little bit of like, how, what exactly do they know? Because uh, when Frodo and Sam leave Faramir in the book, which again, I will always, I will always defend book Faramir because book he does. Faramir is such a champ. He's, he's a true gentleman through and through. He does not try to take the ring. He does not. Yeah. He breaks the cycle of power hungry men so in his good. family and he lets Frodo and Sam go. If I saw that thing on the side of the road, I would not bend to pick it up. It's so good. <laughs> he's a champ. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, so he lets them go and when they say like oh yeah we're there's this one there's a certain path that Gollum is going to take us he says like um I would be careful because my men we do not even like say the name of that path because it's so evil and I've heard of like I don't think he says a monster but he says like an evil lurks within basically um and so sets up that there is some kind of maybe not necessarily that like he knows what it is but like word of mouth being passed down from like generations yeah. that like there was definitely some group of men in Gondor years ago that like went that way and 
didn't make it back or a story got passed yeah, down or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense that he knows that it's just, it's like bad news bears. But exactly. Like, where where else are they going to go? I have to get into Mordor. I know, they have to. Speaking of which, we, we go back to Frodo, Sam, and Gollum, mm-hmm. and they are climbing the stairs. Their feet are so dirty. It's so upsetting. Yeah, the, you see the bottoms Horrible, of their Horrible, dirty feet. feet. <laughs> and they're black. I know. <laughs> I just like every time I think about those those little guys doing this whole journey barefoot, it stresses me out so much. I like know, in the yeah. snow, in the mountains, in the lava, they're not wearing shoes. It's so stressful. This is um this is like a really random and specific like fear of mine, but like I'm always scared that like if I if I was in like a horror movie or something and a murderer was chasing me through the woods, my biggest fear is that I would be having to do it barefoot. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it would suck. My biggest fear is that I would lose my glasses and I would be totally blind. <laughs> so I know that in a fantasy situation, I would be done for very quickly. I know. I would just, I would literally just turn around and be like, you know what? Just kill me. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I don't I don't want to deal with the stress of trying to survive. I would just rather you die than kill me now <laughs> yeah. than kill me an hour from now. <laughs> I was definitely like a little barefoot child because because of Lord of the Rings. I was like, oh, if Hobbits so can funny. do it, I can do it. That's so every so summer funny. I had like, I was like running on sharp gravel with bare feet being like if the hobbits can do it I can do it (laughs) (laughs) that's so as an adult and now I'm stressed out about it (laughs) that's great they reach a ledge on the stairs where they like stop to take a a break and Gollum is up first and he reaches over to help Frodo up Frodo is struggling I don't exactly see how he's he's literally like on this one spot for like five (laughs) minutes I don't get how he didn't make any progression just watching that he's struggling for so long he's flipping like a fish on a line it's so sad (laughs) And uh, Gollum reaches down to help him up, but then the ring falls out of his Mm -hmm. shirt, and Gollum is kind of like, I could take it now, I could take it, you know, win and have my precious back, and Sam sees that happening, Mm -hmm. and he goes to pull out his sword. Which I love, it's like, Frodo can't clear this ledge, and Sam is like, one-handed, got my sword in the other hand, like, I'm ready to go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Gollum is like, okay, well, I'm going to use this moment to my advantage. And so he reaches over and pulls Frodo up. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, just again, just adding to the, it's like a snowball effect of, of what happens in a, in a few minutes with them of the like deceit that Gollum is sowing between them and the wedge that he's driving and this tension building. And this is just like another moment where Frodo See is a moment where Sam is about to kill Gollum. And in Frodo's mind, he was like, that was unfounded because Gollum helped me up anyway. There's something that's so compelling to me about the dynamic between the three of them where I feel like Frodo looks at Gollum and he sees himself and he sees like, that is something that I could become. Like I'm even becoming it now. And Sam looks at Gollum and is like, Gollum is horrible. Frodo would never become that. And so they have this fundamental misunderstanding where Sam is just like, I hate Gollum and I hate the ring. And I love Frodo. And Frodo's like, if you hate Gollum in the ring, you also hate, hate me, me in yeah. a way. And it's like like a rejection. And it's and there's something so compelling about it to me. And I think it's also that, you know, Sam is never going to be able to understand the way that the ring is affecting Frodo, the way that Frodo is. And so yeah. when he is able to like have pity for and feel bad for Gollum, he is able to do that in a way that Sam just can't. Yeah. And that Gollum understands how it's affecting Frodo, which I mean, it happens in the scene where he's like, you have this heavy burden. I know all about it. The other hobbit doesn't know about it. And it's, oh, there's just something so like, it's, it feels like this really potent metaphor for all these different kinds of like mental illness and struggle and like succumbing to like the worst angels of your nature. Um, Yeah. Having like Sam just being like, I believe in you, but I also don't understand why you even would be tempted by this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, or why you would feel pity for Gollum at all. Mm -hmm. is really cool to me. And yeah, Gollum is again, like, driving this this wedge between them and st- and scheming up how to break them apart basically and he he says the fat one will try to take it yeah. and it just made me be like i wonder how sean Aston felt i, <laughs> I think that, like, he like gains weight for the role I, I feel like i read that 
Which is funny because Sam is never like specifically described as like fat in the books, but it's like, I mean, I think I, I, I love Sam. I love, I think Sean Astin's portrayal of Sam is like the most perfect. And what's funny though is that Frodo thing. is actually fat in the book and they mm. point this out at the beginning of Fellowship when they start walking how Frodo has like after, because when they set off, it's been 17 years since Bilbo left in the ring. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a bit of a time jump. He's gotten to used to like a life of comfort, so he's He's gotten a little, you know, a little chubby and they like poke fun at him about it. And they're like, well, no wonder you're moving so slow. It's because you're fat. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and then he gets stabbed and like, (laughs) I think like almost dies. And so he like, and then he's like, oh, I've really slimmed down. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like all, I feel like the hobbits, like, like they should all be like a little bit pleasantly plump. And then like Frodo is the one who's like a little bit of a a waif. Yeah. You see him. Yeah. Get like more skeletal as the journey goes on almost. Yeah. Yeah. I think I um, saw somewhere that Dominic Monaghan, who plays Mary, wore a quote unquote fat suit. Something to add a little more meat to his bones. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he's like a little tummy. It's so cute. I feel like Sam must have been by the end of the journey. I feel like Sam must have been just like pure like muscle, you know, (laughs) like just that like like an absolute beefcake from like just walking, (laughs) carrying Frodo, (laughs) carrying all the pots and all the pans. And then also this is funny because while Gollum and Frodo are Gollum is like he's going to try and take the ring. And in the background, (laughs) Sam is struggling. (laughs) Apparently, it's a very hard ledge. Whatever that ledge is, yeah. (laughs) It makes sense. It's like it's like basically doing like a pull up while you're wearing your pack with all your pots and pans and your sword. Yeah, he's still got his pots and pans and seasonings and he has like so like not just like one pot but like multiple pots and cast iron pans like you really just need one it's a great moment in the book when they're preparing to go to mount doom and (laughs) they're like so tired and weighed down that they decide to leave behind anything that they can spare and he has to leave behind his pots and pans (laughs) and he's like really heartbroken about it yeah it's so (laughs) sad so frodo frodo sam and Gollum climbing the stairs things aren't going good as mm-hmm. always on their front. Back in Minas Tirith, uh, the guards are all looking out over the city and the land, and they're like, so will Rohan come? What do we think will happen? And Gandalf cannot answer because the last mm. he saw them, Theoden was adamant that he would not help them. It, it, it's just such a classic Gandalf moment. He says, courage is the best defense you have now. And it's like, okay, one, a yes or no <laughs> would have sufficed, you know? <laughs> And Thank two, you, Gandalf. that's also like the least comforting thing you could ever say. <laughs> Courage mm-hmm. is the best defense you have now. Like, not your weapons, not your skills, not your shields, not the walls. Yeah. The, like, it's just time to be brave. Yeah, it's 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 a classic Gandalf. I mean, I think it's like the whole theme of it all, especially everything with Gondor is like despair versus hope. Because like Denethor is very much, I think in the books more so, but it's a little bit in the movie too, where he's just like, well, we're giving into despair. Like we're all going to die anyway. So we might as well. I mean, it happens in the movie too, where he's just like, go forth and die as you see fit. Like, I don't care. I'm not going to try anymore. Yeah. And Gandalf is like, you just have to keep you have to keep trying. You yeah. have to be brave even if you don't feel brave. Yeah, and it's um it's interesting because we kind of we kind of saw Rohan go through that as well when Theoden mm. was under Saruman's spell and then also still like in Helm's Deep. We saw this happen with Rohan where mm-hmm. they're having to choose between hope and despair and ultimately hope wins out and they, you yeah. know, kind of like they make a comeback and they are strong again because of it. And then yeah. we see Minas Tirith being led by Denethor and how the lack of hope is really pulling them down here. Yeah, and how it's it's the influence of Sauron both times where we have like Grima Wormtongue whispering in Theoden ear and then we have Denethor like with a he has because he has a palantir I'm yeah. pretty sure and he's like looking into the palantir and like skyping with Sauron and yeah. it's making him really depressed <laughs> and he's taking it out on his whole city. I will I will be interested to see if they address that at all in extended edition but if I remember in theatrical edition they don't show Denethor having a palantir at all and so you're just kind of like why is he crazy like what's going on and it's it's a lot more 
it makes a lot more sense his actions in the book especially yeah. when he tries to burn Faramir alive because at that point he is under the influence of Sauron and he is not in his right mind I think there's a scene that implies it in the extended edition um but it's yeah it's never quite clear it definitely I think the book he's like so interesting in the book because he just is like this the idea of this person who thought that he was like learned enough and noble enough to like go toe to toe with Sauron and ended up falling into despair is such such mm-hmm. a cool character rather than like in the movie he's like necessarily a little bit flattened and is kind of just like he's insane and yeah. a very bad father. <laughs> yeah, that's like actually exactly I to a hundred percent agree with that because I really Denethor was actually one of my favorite characters when I was reading mm. the book, not like a favorite character in terms of like, oh my God, I love him. But he just mm-hmm. made like all of the chapters he was in were just so interesting and were yeah, like really yeah. good chapters to read. Yeah. It's a really interesting, I, there's, I'm so fascinated by the morality of Lord of the Rings because I just find that there are, there, there is this like, there's these themes that are just like really unusual. And just like the theme of despair is one of them where it's just like, you have to hold on to hope no matter what. Um, mm-hmm. You can't, even if you, even if you're like Frodo and you can't hold on to hope anymore, you can't give in to despair either. You just have to at least keep going. Yeah. Um, which I think is what like Gandalf is saying to the people in Minas Tirith. Yeah. Courage is the best defense you have now. <laughs> yeah. Like, thanks. Thank you, thanks, Gandalf. Gandalf. <laughs> thanks for that. So Pippin is pledging his allegiance to Gondor. And at one point he, he like, stutters or hesitates and I was like I I kind of interpreted this as two ways and I'll be interested to see what you think so one way is that this is showing him forgetting the pledge and it's showing like how unprepared he is or it's him hesitating like purposefully as he's saying the words and realizing the the gravity of the situation I think it's kind of that one because the line he stutters on I think is um till death take me and so He's like realizing that he is literally swearing his entire life to this <laughs> horrible man that he just met. <laughs> and yeah, Denethor is like way too excited about this. You see him like smiling gleefully. That is so weird. I cannot handle his smile in this scene. It's so creepy and strange. He makes Pippin kiss his ring. <sighs> Which so filled weird. me with rage because I was yeah. like, d- like, that's Pippin. Pippin is like the most pure and innocent of them all. And he's being subjected to this absolute monster of a person. It's just mm-hmm. not right. Yeah. His like giant hands, like whoever they had doing like a giant hand double, like lifting yeah. up Billy Boyd's face. And you're just like, oh, he's too small. Like he shouldn't, he should not be involved he's in this. so little. I know he shouldn't yeah. be here. And Denethor is saying like, oh, your honor will be rewarded with rewards. I don't know, whatever. But point is, yeah. he sa- as he says, disloyalty with vengeance. Yeah. And it, the focus and he looks at Faramir. drifts from Pippin to Faramir. Yeah. And it disloyal, like disloyalty will be, you know, reward, rewarded or treated with vengeance. I mean, it, it's such a good, uh, I forget what the actor. Oh, Denethor is John Noble. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just such a good performance of like, he is so cruel and so monstrous to Faramir. But then you do see this cheerful side of him and you see this like, oh, when you're in his good graces, he is has this like kindly aspect um, that he like uses. And it's like believable then that Boromir, you know, would have loved him because yeah. when he's in his good graces, Denethor is great. And so you can yeah. you can see how like Boromir didn't grow up to be a total monster because even though Denethor is terrible, he was nice to Boromir still he can control who he's terrible to it's so did you watch the extended edition for the two towers yes I did I know exactly what you saw yeah you saw that scene with the brothers that is one of my favorite I feel like it sets up the family dynamic so skillfully of like oh our our dad's here and and like Faramir's like well I'm really upset and Boromir's like I'm sorry I know that he's mean to you but I still have to go deal with him and be nice to him like it's such a complicated family dynamic that's it just tells you everything about those characters where Boromir is better than him like he's better than Denethor he's he's above all of this but he can't quite turn aside completely from the approval of his father Mm -hmm. even though like that would be the kindest thing for him to do for Faramir's sake oh my gosh yeah and like it's just just so good (laughs) I can't I I literally can't say anything else because I will will be here for another hour and a half if I just start talking more I love so are you like are you like are these like your favorites like the stewards sons Faramir is my favorite is like top one of my favorite characters at least well I don't know. It's complicated because at the end of the books, I would have I 
I would have said, yes, Faramir's like one of my top, you know, three characters. But just what they did to him in the movies makes me so angry. Yeah. <laughs> it fills me with rage. You've never known. He um, is such a champ in the books. I can't. I, he's so sweet to them. Like it is like the <sighs> most lovely scene. Uh, and yeah. So he, anyway. Um, oh, oh, yeah. OK. So what I was doing is I was looking mm-hmm. at I was looking up who played uh, Faramir. David Win Winham. Winham? Mm-hmm. Winham. I'll say Winham. Yeah. David Winham plays Faramir. I brought this up a lot during the Two Towers extended episodes, but Faramir's back with those sad blue eyes, just those sad mm-hmm. eyes staring mm-hmm. into your soul and heart. He's got that really good, like, listening, like, he's, like, <sighs> un- like unshed tears glimmering in his eyes where you're just, you, you want to hold him and comfort him. And when he speaks, you can tell, he's, like, He's ho- he's using every ounce of his energy to like hold it together. I know there is a really good scene with him and Pippin in the extended edition that I'm excited for you to experience. Oh, I'm excited! It's very cute. It's very cute. And Denethor, yeah, like asks about Osgiliath, and it's overrun. And there's Denethor is not pleased about that to say the mm-hmm. least. And he says, "Is there a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will?" And just seeing the realization go across Faramir's face, mm-hmm. that like, because what? So what he says next is, "I." He's like, "I see now. You wish that I had been exchanged with Boromir and that he yeah. had lived and I had died." And Denethor says, "Yes, I wish." That. And <laughs> Denethor says, "Yes." He agrees with him. <laughs> yes, I wish that you were dead. And. <sighs> Bad father. Watching Faramir as he, like, realizing this is yeah. heartbreaking because you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of like when you have a fight with your parents, and especially like when you're a teenager and you're like, I hate them, they hate me. Like, but deep down, you still know that, like, they love you and they care for you, even though maybe, like, they yelled at you for something or whatever. That's probably also what Faramir thought. He was also probably like, yeah, he he tells me I know Faramir's uses and they are few, but he probably still loves me. But for him to realize that he wishes he was dead and Boromir was alive, it's just absolutely mm-hmm. heart wrenching. It's devastating, and to sort of have that, I'm not sure exactly in the timeline of how recently they learned that Boromir died, but it wasn't that long ago. And so just yeah, realizing like not only could I never measure up to my brother but now that my brother is dead you can't even like realize that I'm your only child yeah and like you have to be kinder to me it just still is like you're still stuck on my brother it's yeah so 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 sad so sad and so it's it's really interesting here because during this chapter when I was reading it I was kind of I was like I was laughing a bit because it was so insane and Denethor is so dramatic in the book. Um, And it's a lot more, it's a lot more casual the way that he treats Faramir and the things that he says. Um, And it it came across to me when I was reading it, that it was more like Faramir is aware of how Denethor feels about him, but he's kind of like above it all, or he doesn't let himself uh, ruminate on those thoughts and feelings for too long. And I realize it's because Tolkien, doesn't ever he never really would like write about emotion or the reactions of the characters the way that books do nowadays where Mm -hmm. it would it would be like if this scene was in a book written now it would be like is there a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will and then we would have a whole paragraph that like showed Faramir looking sad and like his like tears welling up in his eyes and then his like voice choking as he says you wish now that our places had been exchanged and you would you would read those words that signal to you that oh he's very hurt by this but you don't get that when you're reading Lord of the Rings because Tolkien Tolkien spent his description instead on the landscape (laughs) well it's like certain certain characters do get like emotional yeah emotional descriptions but it is often like it's often like presented without comment in a way where he's yeah. not telling you how to feel about it. He is being like, here's the actions they're taking or here is the thought that they're thinking. But exactly. I'm not going to be like, and then they felt depressed. Like, mm-hmm. it'll just have them talking in a way that you know that they are depressed. And so it's it's much sadder now when you're mm-hmm. watching it, you know, unfold on screen with a lot of like very good actors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. and you just once again, you have Fairmere's just sad 
sad blue eyes staring at you. The, and, yeah, and it is the casualness of Denethor sitting down to his meal and just being like, I don't think we should let Asgillioth go. Like, won't anyone go back and take it? And he's just, he knows what he's doing, but he's so deep in this, like, really ugly emotion. And <laughs> Pippin is just here. It's like if you're at, like, your friend's house and they're getting in a huge fight with their parents and you're like, oh, Sweet my God. Like, oh God, please let me go. And, uh, <laughs> Fer- yeah, so Faramir swallows like holds it Mm. together and is like okay since i am not boromir i will go and do my best and if i return maybe your feelings will change about me denethor uh, what does he say that would depend on the manner of your return yeah basically denethor's like you better come back as a dead body or not at all is essentially like what he's saying since you were robbed of boromir I will do what I can in his stead. If I should return, think better of me, Father. That will depend on the manner of your return. And it's yeah. so terrible. And um, yeah, also in this moment, as Pippin is looking on, there's this one reaction shot we get of him where he's kind of connecting the dots because he hasn't met he hasn't met Faramir until now he is now realizing oh this is Boromir's brother Boromir died protecting us and Mm -hmm. this moment is so is 20 billion times better when you know that in the book we learn after the fact in the appendices that Pippin names one of his sons after Faramir I know. It's so good. It's great. I love Fair it. Fair took. Yeah. yeah. So back back in Mordor mm-hmm. with Frodo, Sam, and Gollum. Frodo and Sam are sleeping. Sam is trying really hard to stay awake because he doesn't he doesn't trust Gollum. Yeah. And Gollum is pretending to be asleep. And it's only... Which I also love, like, the amount of scenes in the book where Sam is like, you go to sleep, Mr. Frodo. I'll stay awake. And then, like, he immediately falls asleep. Like, yes! it happens so oh many God. times. I made, I made so much fun. Of, and it, but, Because it's not... I love it. <laughs> it's also not just Sam. It happens with Frodo several times, too, where he'll be yeah. like, Sam, you've are, you're exhausted, too. I'll stay up and, <laughs> and keep watch. And then Frodo falls asleep. They're terrible at keeping watch. And what's, They're very small and they're very tired. What's so <laughs> funny, though, is that in those moments where they both fall asleep, that's when Gollum like, goes off and does something and he comes back and they're like, what were you doing? He's like, I don't know. What do you think I was doing? <laughs> Sneaking. <laughs> And yeah. Uh, yeah, so I love I love that they have that little moment of Sean Austin like trying so hard to stay awake yeah. but he can't. And Gollum like wakes up because he's been pretending to f- to sleep so that Sam would go to sleep. Yeah, he's been doing a little kitty cat purr, which I love. <laughs> I, I like Gollum as a weird little a cat. little snore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he sneaks over and takes the lame bus bread out of Sam's pack, and he throws it over the edge and sprinkles some crumbs on Sam. I 100% like as a I grew up a chubby child um, and I still love food to this day, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, so like all of those all of those like, hey, Jimmy Kimmel, I told my kids I stole their Halloween candy videos and you have the kids who like <gasps> just break down in tears. Yeah, that would have been me 100%. And I would have like screamed at my parents. And so to watch this happen, <sighs> the rage that like filled my bones i completely get why sam does what he what he does it is so upsetting it's their literal like last piece of food yeah and it's oh it's so it's so painful and it's also like the last bit of like anything good that they have because Mm -hmm. it's elven bread and elven bread is like yeah it's it's made with love (laughs) yeah and sam wakes up and is like what have you been doing sneaking around and Gollum's like why do you always suspect me of doing something I wasn't doing anything and so he's like so what were you doing sneaking sneaking (laughs) he's such a little he's so annoying he just has such like little sibling vibes where like it's (laughs) pushing buttons yeah 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 like he's and just like pushing buttons and so easily able to manipulate like like to get Frodo on his side but then to be like antagonizing Sam at every opportunity and then being like why are you being so mean to me yeah I haven't done anything wrong yeah so they wake up he wakes up Frodo and says we have to get going reaches into his bag to get some lame bus it's all gone. It's all gone. This is where Gollum turns Frodo on Sam because 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Frodo is like, what would Gollum have to do with the lambus bread? He doesn't like lambus bread. And he points to the crumbs on Sam's cloak. And this is where Frodo, Frodo is, you know, he turns on Sam. Yeah. There's a, a great piece of like physical acting that I love from Gollum where they're like, where could it have gone? And like Gollum is just like rubbing his head and looking around like, like so, know. such a bad actor, like so, like trying so hard to pretend to be innocent. And it's so obvious, but Frodo's just like too far gone to, yeah. to be understanding anything. Sam finally does what like we've all been wanting him to do the whole time yeah. and what we've all been wanting to do. He's, he, <laughs> Like is like you're a liar and attacks Gollum and goes to town. He is he goes ape Shire on Gollum. He loses his Shire, as yeah. the kids say on TikTok these days. Sam woke up and chose violence. <laughs> I love it again. The dichotomy of Samwise Gamgee, where he is so sweet and gentle with Frodo, and then he's like, "I will murder anyone who." I'm gonna cut a. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> I will murder um, you. It's so funny because his disposition in the book is so different because Mm -hmm. he it's like not until the climax really of return of the king that he starts attacking Gollum and tries to Mm -hmm. like goes to kill him or or something yeah and so sam movie sam is a lot more i don't know active in his role i think also because like he doesn't in the book he and frodo are on their relationship is in a better place best buds to the yeah. end of all things. Yeah, in the yeah, book. and in this, yeah, in this, it's like Gollum is actively like like coming in between him mm-hmm. and this person yeah. that he cares about yeah. so much. Yeah, and um, so this is uh, this is a very pivotal point in that's what I'm talking about, listeners. Because so Molly, for your context, reading the books, I did not like Sam. Um, uh, I he I just really? found, I found him really annoying. <laughs> oh my god! I I bet if that's I went shocking, I bet if me. I went back and read the books, I would still kind of find him annoying um because in the books their relationship is a lot more like master servant and it just makes Mm -hmm. me uncomfortable rather than just like rather than just you know close companions who are like equals so I was very annoyed with Sam in the books and everyone was telling me oh well he's much better in the movies and I was always like yeah he yeah he's definitely getting better he's better this was the moment where I was like Sam, Sam is right. I'm with Sam on this one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Ghost. I was like, yeah, Sam, get him. What up? It's Mary Clip from the future. I forgot to mention while recording that I have some audio clips from my first reactions to Return of the King that I will insert every now and then like right here. Sam! Go, Sam! He poisoned you against me. Oh my God. Frodo! You would be dead. I get why everyone likes Sam. I'm get... so glad I have that on camera. <laughs> I still don't like him that much, but like, I understand it. Cause when they do this in the movie, it's much, you're much more sympathetic to him. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm very fascinated with their like, it's just a very British, like, like upstairs, downstairs kind of relationship of, like, upper class, lower class. Yeah. And I love how it – so I'm very interested in it. I find it very compelling. And I love how at this point in the story, like, it should be so far behind them. But when Frodo tells him to stay, he, like, can't disobey Frodo. Like, he can't at, – at this, like, pivotal moment, like, he's, he just, like, has to so listen to what he says. It, yeah, so what happens is Frodo pulls Sam off of Gollum and Frodo uh, Sam is like, can't you see what he's doing to us? Blah, blah, and Frodo's like, no, you're the problem. Mm-hmm. Go home, Sam. Do not come with us anymore. And Sam is, he is like so careful about Frodo's feelings that he, like, he'll do anything to make Frodo happy. And he's like, if that's what Frodo wants right now, then... I will, I will, like, I'll turn around and leave. He just, like, crumples. Like, he doesn't, as soon as Frodo says that, he just, like, hits the ground. And, like, it's, there's just, oh, there's something so, so tragic about it where it just is, like, Sam's, like, consideration of himself is so low. Like, his, like, consideration of his own abilities and, Mm -hmm. like, the fact that he can help Frodo. Like, he has such a low self-esteem that he doesn't think, like, I have to, like, go with you. It's, like, Frodo, I'm used to Frodo always being right. And so... 
yeah. when he tells me this, he must be right. Mm-hmm. And then, like, of course, later he changes his mind on yeah. that. And yeah. it's very satisfying. But, like, the tragedy of it in this moment is incredible. Yeah. So filming for this scene was actually um, really, like, interesting and I don't know kind of questionable it's still you couldn't tell from the way that it turned out luckily so while they were filming Lord of the Rings or while they were filming Fellowship of the Ring there was a flood and all of the exterior filming had to be paused and the only indoor facility that could be used that was available was a squash court at a local hotel. And so the next day, they turned it into a set for this scene. Sean Astin and Elijah Wood were shocked that they were they were told like hey we're gonna film this very intense scene tomorrow and so they're like are you kidding me Andy Serkis hadn't even been cast at this point so they had a they had a like crew member like fill in and read his lines I guess Um, and so they went ahead and filmed it all of Sean Astin's scenes were successfully completed but the next day the sun came out and the flooding went away so they started exterior filming again and with this intent to come back to the squash court where the set was to finish Elijah Wood's filming. That didn't happen until a year later. Wow. Oh my God. That's so interesting. Came back and shot Elijah Wood's side of this scene a year later where the set had been and these like poor poor squash players (laughs) who like used (laughs) this as their court couldn't play squash. (laughs) For a whole year? (laughs) Because it was damn Lord of the Rings people. That's so interesting yeah I can see that though I can see there's a lot of like close shots on our faces that kind of like yeah Mm -hmm. you don't see them interacting that much and it's just I don't know I wouldn't have been able to tell that this was something that they did kind of like last minute preparation for that they filmed the sides of the scenes a year apart which is just so bonkers I'm like blown away by that because I yeah you couldn't you couldn't tell at all and it like the the end result like it doesn't show in it at Mm -hmm. all like it's such it's such a poignant scene and it feels so yes raw (laughs) in Minas Tirith again how we how you mentioned earlier how Peter Jackson's really good at like building tension Mm -hmm. um the army is leaving and the (sighs) whole town is quiet yeah everyone is standing is like standing around outside to like send them off and people are throwing like flowers on the on the path yeah. to like I don't know bless them it's just very what's the uh starts with a an m death morbid morbid that's the word I'm looking for yes yeah. it's very morbid feeling like they're everyone watching is like we're sending our brothers our fathers our sons essentially off to their death right now yeah it's so tragic and it's so I love that I even just love like the detail of the flowers and the herbs that they're throwing because it that's such a specific part of Gondor culture in the book, like the the different plants that they have growing in their area. Oh, yeah, that's true. I didn't um, even think where they about just that. talk about it. Yeah, and so it just is like there's just this little nod to it. I also did you notice Peter Jackson's children in this scene? Yes, yeah, yeah. I was gonna. I don't know if I've ever. I don't think I've ever like brought this up or talked about this before. Yeah. So one of Peter Jackson's quote unquote like signature director moves <laughs> is putting his children in as like extras. They first appear in Fellowship of the Ring when Bilbo is telling his story to the kids at the party then they are seen again hiding in the caves at helm's deep in two towers and then here they are in the crowd and this was the first the first couple times i like didn't really i like didn't notice them or didn't pay attention this was the first time where like when it we do a close-up of these these kids faces i was like oh that there they are that those are his kids (laughs) they're so cute they're so cute they 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 work so well as like hobbits and yes yeah and gondor people it's great (laughs) i believe um i read a trivia that was like every actor in this film had to wear wigs with the exception of peter jackson's son for fellowship of the ring because he (laughs) had like natural hobbit hair already cute (laughs) and they're always credited as so they're credited as cute hobbit children cute Rohan children <laughs> and, and this film I think they're credited as cute Gondor children. That's so funny. That's so I cute. That. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of like Peter Jackson being a dad and children, Gandalf comes up and is like, Faramir, your dad loves you. Don't do this. <laughs> Which is like c- categorically untrue. <laughs> like- yeah. Which I think that's what I I think that's what I said when I was the first time I was watching this because he comes out and he's 
Gandalf is like, you're throwing your life away. This is dumb. And Faramir's like, what other choice do I have? I have yeah. to be loyal to my country and my city. Yeah. And this is the only way yeah. I can do that in his eyes. Gandalf says, your father loves you, Faramir. And I was like, he does not. At least, yeah. like, not right now. Yeah. The, the, the other lesson that we could give Faramir right now is, like, you don't need your father's You love. don't need your father's approval. Which is what I I loved the scene. It's at the end of Two Towers Extended Edition. Faramir is helping Frodo and Sam escape Osgiliath, and Sam is like, mm. um, like you've he shown your, your quality character. the yeah. highest. <laughs> and I'm like, see, Faramir, you don't need your dad's approval. You just need Sam's. <laughs> you have Sam Gamgee's approval. There's nothing more that you need. That's worth Denethor's approval five times over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gandalf is like. Kind of like as an afterthought, he's like, he like your father loves you. Uh, maybe he'll realize it before it's too late. It's like, Ugh. or maybe he'll realize it and try to burn you alive. Mm-hmm. Out of love. Who knows? The way that they go off to battle and like the music that underscores it when they are, the horses are approaching. It is not, because we've had a lot of battles so far that are very triumphant. And it's like, oh, this is a cool battle. This is fun, action packed, blah, blah, blah. This is, it's such a downer. And there's so much tension and you just feel dread that they are marching to their deaths. there's nothing they can do yeah it's they're just they they all know that they're riding to their deaths and they they have to and it's this choice between like do they disobey their king or their steward or do they obey and go to their death and it's it's so sad yeah and then to cut back to Denethor as he is sit like he is the one who is causing all of this he is the one who has ordered this and then he is up in his what do they call it uh, the phrase that's like up in your high up on your high horse, isn't that yeah. it? Yeah, basically. <laughs> He's in his like little throne room eating a feast. Disgusting, I might add. We'll talk about that more in a oh second. Oh my gosh, yeah. As if like his only living son now and the rest of Gondor's army aren't going to their deaths and that he didn't order it. And it's just not, yeah. you just, you see how it's not affecting him at all. Well, I think like it is, I thought actor is just so good. You can tell that he is like, he's got the attitude of the kind of person who like has made a bad choice and they feel like they have to stick to it now and they have to really it's defend true, it. Yeah. And he's mm-hmm. just like, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to sit down and eat my horrible chicken wings and like not think about the fact that everyone's dying but like I, I think I think that, that that actor like really like holds both of those emotions mm-hmm. and he asks Pippin sing do you know any songs can you sing and Pippin's like I sing well enough for my own kinsmen but our songs are not fit for your halls in these evil times and I I like kind of just realized I was like oh because th- that's because that's because hobbits are they don't have any like sad songs. They don't have any songs yeah. about bad things happening or about war because the hobbits just by and large don't experience that. All of their songs yeah. are drinking songs. Yeah. And so it, it's like really heart wrenching to realize that Pippin is just so out of his element here. And that he's also Pippin is like, like really doesn't want to sing. And it's like, I don't feel like singing. You're I'm, I'm so sad that Faramir is going to his death. And so disturbed by what's happening yeah. around me and like I don't I don't have the ability to like sing for you but he's he has to that's something that he does when he's drunk and partying yeah. with Mary and like yeah. this is, they're not drinking they're not eating they're not dancing this is not happy and he's not with yeah. Mary and so he's like I'm not in a mood to sing singing is a happy thing for us did you know that the scene was put in because um the screenwriters went to karaoke I literally wrote yeah. that down for it yeah sorry I have no, all the, no, I have no, all the I trivia love it. no I love that yeah, yeah. so um Denethor forces him to sing and so Pippin starts singing the song so the lyrics were taken from it's like called quote unquote a walking song and it appears at the start of Fellowship of the Ring when Mary oh that's so ironic because 
Pippin isn't with them at that point, I don't think. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, I take that back. I take that back. It's Mary is the one who is like already gone ahead. Um, And it's Sam okay, and yeah. Frodo and Pippin, and they're walking and leaving Hobbiton, and they sing a song. And so the lyrics that are sung here are taken from that. So I appreciate and that And I they... think it's Bilbo's, Bilbo's song that he wrote. Yeah, and so I appreciate that they, like, took that detail from the book, from the original source material. Yeah. And Billy Boyd came up with the tune. And so, yeah, the reason this scene happened is because uh, co-writer Philippa Boyens went out to a karaoke bar with some of the younger male cast members, and she was struck by the quality of his voice. (laughs) So cute. I I love Billy Boyd in this role so much, again, as a... Former like Pippin fangirl, this scene blew my mind. Like I would, I would just watch it. You don't and have watch to say it. former. You can, you can be a, a current Pip- Pippin fangirl. I fan feel like girl. I don't like, I don't like crush on Pippin anymore. Like, but I, I'm like very much a fan of mm, Pippin. Yeah, and yeah. This, I just feel like, I feel like being like 12 and being like, oh my god, this is the most romantic thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just think that's like it just seems so on brand for like the hobbits in general that this came about because they like they went to a karaoke bar and they were singing yeah. and I don't know. It just it's also it's fitting. So it's great. Sweet. It's great. Yeah. He sings he sings a little song and it's Yeah. It's it's very good is all I can say, you know? Because again, how I was saying earlier, how the battles up until now are usually like very triumphant, like action packed sequences. But this is very morbid and it's very somber and the the lyrics and the tune and the oh and just the way that the way that they do the sound editing and the way that the sound will just drop out and you'll just only have the sound of his voice and then the horse hooves and then you Mm -hmm. only have his voice and like the creak of a bowstring as like the arrows being pulled back like it's so it's just like nobody shoots battles like this and it makes it so incredibly like it's very close up on this like horrible rusty arrowhead and then you see the men riding and you're like that's about to like be killing them and it's so yeah tactile in this way that is is really effective home is behind the world ahead and there are many paths to tread it's like interspersed with denethor eating Mm. like Mm -hmm. disgustedly gross like just shoveling food in his mouth which like i I get it i can relate to that i would (laughs) (laughs) if i was in a stressful situation i would also be eating food so i get that the last time i made the last time i watched this movie i made the denethor like dinner to eat which like a roast chicken and like cherry tomatoes and grapes. I was gonna say, did you get to make? Yeah, he's also yeah, yeah. he's like eat. He's such a, he's just such a messy eater. I just want to go over I and know. be like, close your mouth while you chew and use a You're napkin. You're the steward. Gosh, yeah. I saw. I read a theory that was I think based. I don't. I don't know what this is based on, but just the idea that he's like um, eating tomatoes off of lead plates. And that that would like the like acid in the tomatoes would like make the lead poisonous, and so there's like a theory that he was getting lead poison the whole time, oh. which I just think is fun. But that's th- just no, another that's additional reason for him being insane. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. Yeah. However, my my like one qualm with this with this moment is that watching it the first time, it it was like really weird to me. It wasn't so much of, oh, this is so cool or like, oh, wow, I have like chills like running down my spine right now. It was more like, this seems really weird and out of place to me. <laughs> that is it is like a music video. It's very strange. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's also because reading the books, you know that the hobbits, sing- there's lots of singing. They're singing mm-hmm. on every other page in the book. And so you know that singing is just a part of this culture. But for the movies, they took out pretty much every single instance of a song, which I'm not I'm not complaining about <laughs> necessarily <laughs> because I don't think we needed this to turn into a musical. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, oh, no. my God, I would love that. They <laughs> took out so much singing that this seems a little bit weird and out of place because we haven't. The only other time we've seen them sing is earlier in Return of the King when Mary and Pippin are doing like a, a bar song, a drinking song for everyone in yeah. Edoras. Yeah. So it just kind of like, I don't know, caught me off guard at first. 
Yeah, it is. It's very Tolkien, but it's out of place in the movie. And like the way it's shot is very much just like in the middle of this epic fantasy movie, we have a music video. A little, but, yeah, music number. Oh, I just love it. I just love it so much. The like last shot of this battle, we see all of these arrows like being pulled back from the like orcs and Osgiliath and they are launched to fire, but we don't see them hit anyone we don't actually see the battle taking place we just see the lead up and as the arrows are being launched we cut back to Dinothor as like blood red tomato juice Mm. is dripping down his chin Mm -hmm. it's so good you know like we're not going to show the violence that's happening but from the way that Denethor is violently eating you can imagine what's happening in Osgiliath yeah it is so much more the shots of Denethor eating are so much more violent than any amount of like or yeah. <laughs> killing that they could show it's really really well done yeah honestly yeah yeah and then pippin just like with a single tear falling down his cheek <sighs> yeah. yeah and pippin yeah pippin like has a moment where he's like kind of disturbed at what denethor just asked him to do and like by his own song and he's like heart, yeah heart. oh I, there was there's one more i think it's I think it might be like right after this where it cuts to Gandalf sitting alone in the courtyard and it's just silence. That is a beautiful shot. Yeah. It's like a beautiful like Renaissance painting. It's so he's just sitting and he's like failed in this. Yeah. And it's so hard because in the previous episode, the last scene of that was where um, Pippin was saying to Gandalf, he's like, we've got the white wizard. That's got to count for something. Yeah. And you see... You see that here where he he's the white wizard and he can't do anything about this. And it's so rough. Yeah, so. he's just so Gandalf is such a, a tragic figure in an interesting way because he is just like the most active of the wizards. He's always trying to push things towards the better. But because he's so involved, that means that he sees a lot of like failure as well. And he sees like all these mortals that he's involved with die. And it's yeah, it's just like you, you realize the weight of it in that scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of this movie section for discussion of this week's episode. <laughs> Real quick, though, I need to I need to share this week's is Viggo Mortensen actually a ranger fact. Uh, mm. Molly, I do this every week where okay. I share a real life trivia fact about Viggo Mortensen on the filming love, of Lord of the Rings. I love I love this man. <laughs> that make you go, is Viggo Mortensen actually a ranger? <laughs> um, so this is taken from an interview where people were asking him, or the interviewer was asking him, like, is it true that like you went and camped in the woods by yourself for months? And he's like, I think some of this has been exaggerated a bit. He said, I did go fishing in costume during lunch breaks when we were in more remote areas during the shoot and did tramp around in the forest a little. But I did not live in the woods in costume, as some have reported. <laughs> I love that. I have definitely seen photos of, of him fishing in his Aragorn costume. It's so, oh my so God. charming. So I love funny. it. <laughs> yeah, there's this one. It's like a really br- short video that like showed up on my YouTube recommended where they're filming and they're like, in a, it's not even like a lunch break, like he says in this quote. They were like in between shots, and he's like, "Oh, we have a bit. We have fifteen minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go fish." <laughs> God, so cute. I love yep, it. Yep, I, lo- yep. I love it. I love that he like like adopted the horses. I love that he it's had great. he gotten to the part where he like probably I feel like he gets arrested for like waving his. Sword I don't around. think he got arrested, <laughs> but yeah, he would take his sword or he got, with like, him. And yet a cop at least like yeah. stopped him and was like, "What's the story?" He here? would take his sword with him to like go train, and members yeah. of the public would call the police and be like, "There's this dude here at our gym, and he has a sword." <laughs> So He's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I yep, love yep. that. Well, Molly, thank you so much for coming on and discussing this part of Return of the King. What would you like to share with our audience and where can people find you on the internet? You can uh, find my main Twitter is at Molly Ostertag, mostly just professional updates about graphic novels and TV writing and stuff. Um, For all of my Lord of the Rings nonsense, I have an alternate Twitter called Hobbit Gay, where I just post like a lot of fan art um, and a lot of stupid takes. So yeah, that's that's more relevant to this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. I love it. That's what I'm talking about as a proud member of WBE. You can learn more about the network by going to WBE.org, where you will find all of our shows like Hello from Elsewhere, which, side note, this week I will be guest hosting Bacon and Eggs with Valerie Winters. Valerie and I are going to be discussing The Princess Diaries, and it is a dream come true. But you should also listen to Hello from Elsewhere. <laughs> 
Do you find yourself thinking deeply about pop culture? Do you wish for a super nerdy podcast that explores your favorite movies and books? Well, look no further. From WBNE, it's Hello from Elsewhere. On our podcast, we promise to literally transport you to all your favorite fictional settings. I don't think we can actually promise that. Yes, we can. Travel with us to the Death Star. We can't put people in harm's way like that. Or visit beautiful new Asgard. That's so many plane tickets to Norway. Explore the eras of Jane Austen or Frankenstein. Metaphorically, we don't know how to implement time travel. We do now on Hello From Elsewhere. We're going to get in trouble with these promises. With new episodes every other Friday, Hello From Elsewhere is available wherever you find your podcasts. Yes, that part is true. You can even listen on the Hogwarts Express. Oh boy. The cover art is by Graphite, a.k.a. Vaishon Brandon. You can support him on Instagram at graphite.vmb. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at TolkienAboutPod, and you can also join the Facebook group, which is linked in the description. You can find me on Twitter at mcwhatsup and Instagram at mcturndownforwhat. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com slash TolkienAboutPod to explore the different tiers. You can join Discord for $3 a month, which is a very fun time. Or you can become a sponsor of the podcast like Ethan. Ethan has been a long time supporter of the podcast but recently upped his pledge to become a sponsor thank you so much ethan for your renewed support of the podcast which i i can't believe and i'm just so thankful for it if you like what you're listening to please rate and review when you rate and review it helps other people find the podcast like maybe one day Stephen Colbert. That's right. Every single time you rate and review, you bring me one step closer to Stephen Colbert discovering this podcast and potentially coming on as a guest one day, which by the way, I would die. I don't know if I actually want that because I would be way too nervous to record with him. He knows so much about Lord of the Rings. It's a bit scary. Anyway, please rate and review if you like this podcast. Next week, we will be picking up where we left off at one hour, 11 minutes and two seconds and going to one hour, 46 minutes and 30 30 seconds. So it picks up as Theoden, Aragorn, and everyone are arriving at the campground to assemble all the soldiers for the Rohirrim. And we will end as Frodo leaves Shelob's lair before it cuts back to the Siege of Gondor. Well, Molly, thank you so much for joining me. Do you have any parting words for the audience? I just can't believe that you that didn't like Sam in the book. Like I'm heart, I'm heartbroken over this. He was my boy. Um, so yeah, once again, you can follow me on Hobbit Gay for like Sam justice for Samwise Gamgee. <laughs> <laughs> Justice for Samwise Gamgee, nice. And that's what I'm talking about. 